Welcome back into another episode of the podcast. Uh, today, big time guest, uh, Coach Chad Henning. He's the offensive line coach at Minnesota State University. Big time. You're not a Twitter coach, but people will know you from Twitter, I think. You're just a big time coach. Uh, coach, welcome welcome in. Yeah, I, I appreciate you. Uh, I feel like we've talked about this for a long time now, and it's good to, to finally get on you know, your podcast and I've followed you for years now. And, you know, I think you do a really good job. And, um, you know, here at Minnesota State, we really just try to, you know, mold young men, but also from the standpoint of, um, you know, trying to help, um, you know, high school coaches and, and the relationship there is really important to me. And, you know, I think that our relationship's gone back for a while now. And I'm more than happy to, to jump on with you, at, you know, as a listener, but now as, as a guy that, gets to jump on and, and talk to you is is awesome to me and um i just really appreciate this opportunity that was the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me so you <laughs> would know because uh, i'm i always tell people this, i'm a nobody coach that tries to learn as much as i can and build connections the best way i know how and because of COVID, it turned out to be this, like this podcast. Like, I, st I think I'm the reason for COVID because <laughs> I, I started this in February of 2020. And it was supposed to be like what Pat McAfee does. Like, I like talking sports. Um, I saw what Coach Mackey was doing on YouTube and Coach Mack also. And people, I'm like, well, what if I start doing this? Blah, 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 blah. Then March of 2020 hits, COVID hits. I'm like, well, there's no sports to talk about. So I just wasted my time. And then it was Coach Banstra started to hop on people's stuff. And then me and him connected. Then he became super competitive and was like, I'm starting a podcast. I'm going to talk to people. And I said, well, the hell you are. I'm going to start talking to people. And so it just kind of took off. And then I realized, oh, I'm building connections like I'm talking to people and then it was college coaches like you guys are all in college like talking to little old me and i'm like oh this is taking off and i'm not making money but like just from the knowledge and everything else so it's crazy that you guys say yes to it to begin with so i appreciate guys like you that say yes i think you not try to schedule this for like a year but like we're so busy but just crazy like you say yes um, Coach Rodriguez at Akron was big for me in the summer. Like these guys that are big old time old line coaches just say yes, and I can't believe it. I'm like, I'm a little yeah. Illinois coach. For sure. I, I think you know, you reached out to me when I was at Upper Iowa and uh, oh yeah. And I, yeah, that was my first full time job. And and that's when I kind of started following you and, and listening to your, you know, podcasts. And you know, I think from a guy that I can have a good you know, conversation with, but also a relationship with. And, um, you know, I, I thought I always not owed it to you, but like, I, I wanted to be on your show and, um, you know, it, it, to me, it doesn't matter where I'm at as a coach. Like I'm a human being, uh, I could be coaching at abundant life Christian school. Like I was, you know, in 2017, um, you know, coaching eight man football in Madison, Wisconsin, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, football is football and you you kind of realize who the, the real people are and you kind of realize who you know, are the, the people that that support, you know, people like me. Um, and that's why I always thought that it was really important for me, you know, to, to have a conversation with you. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we've set this up. This is probably the third time we've actually set it up. I think the first two times I had to recruit on campus mm -hmm. the first time, second time I have a, you know, impromptu staff meeting. And so. Mm -hmm it's it's been something that i've always um you know kind of kept on my schedule as something i needed to do and you know to kind of pay you tribute to to the work that you've done and that that kind of speaks to you as a person and it doesn't matter to me if you're a, a middle school coach because that's where i started it doesn't matter if you're a high school coach it doesn't matter if you're you know, like people are people and you know, i think as long as you understand that um coaches are it doesn't matter what level you're at. There are better coaches, you know, below me. There are better coaches in the high school, middle school level and, you know, have their, their day job, that sort of thing. I'm just lucky enough to, to be able to coach this and have that be my job. I think that's something that I strive for for years and years and was very fortunate to be hired by Coach Hoffer to come back in, in 2018 as a GA and, um, you know, kind of get my start and be 
um, hired as a full-time offensive line coach in, uh, in 2000, 2021 now. So it's, uh, it's been a hell of a ride. Yeah. You're a busy guy. You're, you've been all over the place. Uh, yeah. Uh, cause I'll tell you this, this podcast is tough. Cause when I ask people if they're busy, I feel like I bother them. Or if I ask multiple times, you know, cause you're not the first one. There's a couple people that are like, Oh yeah, I'll do it. And I don't hear from them. At least I hear from you sometimes. But like other people, like I, I don't hear from them. And then I go, Oh, Hey, you want to do this? Like, Oh yeah. Can you do it tomorrow? And I'll say, yeah. And then I don't hear anything. And, and you know, that type of stuff. Um, but no, I think I heard you on uh Schiffman's and that's when I was like, yeah, I'm going to ask this guy. Cause I was all about O-line coaches at the time. Um, but then when you got the big Minnesota state job, I was like, uh, oh, nope, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's big time now. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's oh. called, it, it, me and shipping go back along. It always, it all started with the hog football chat. And, uh-huh. um, when I actually got, so I was a GA in 2019, when I went from the GA of the old line coach to tight ends, I had reached out to him like, Hey, how do I start a t- uh, tight end chat? He's uh-huh. like, wait, like you, you just jump on with the hog. And, and so that's kind of where I started with him and, he's been a really good, you know, friend of mine and, you know, kind of every conference we go to, we kind of meet up and, you know, him at the, the high school level now. And, you know, I, I just think that if you take away titles and you just understand who people are and you understand the relationships they have with their guys, they coach and, you know, the guys they come in contact with, that's what's important to me. I don't, I don't care what your title is. I, I, I care that you're a good person and you know the for me you know being at minnesota state and being the old line coach and um it's a dream come true it's it's i still shake myself from time to time that i'm you know the offensive line coach at my alma mater and in a room that i was you know kind of made an adult in as a player so um you know i i just really appreciate people that you know, you, that I have relationships with and, and, you know, kind of build those, those relationships with people. And I, I don't, I don't care what level you're at. I, I think coaches are coaches and, um, you know, I've seen you through the years uh, doing really positive things with the coaching community. And, um, you know, I'm all about, you know, obviously helping you, but also helping other coaches out there. And, and if they need things and stuff like that, I, you know, Twitter's kind of blown up. I'm, I'm a person that kind of speaks my mind, but also the nonsense that comes to my head, I just tweet it. And mm-hmm. a lot of junk, but people like it. Um, but, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, I, I hope I can help as many people as possible to be the best player, the best coach, the best mentor that they can possibly be, but also have fun at, at the same time. Because I think life is too short to just do things that you have to do, but also – you know, kind of focus on things that you want to do and, and help people. That's so dang important to me to help, um, whether it be young people, um, you know, people that I'm friends with, um, that I, that I think highly of, I, I think that's really, really important to me to, to be somebody that if I can help you, I'm all about it. And, um, that's, that's where I think that you come in of our relationship over the years and, and the things that you've done with me in communication, you've, I owe this not only to you, but a lot of people that have helped me get to where I'm at. Oh, you owe me nothing. Don't worry about it. Nobody owes me a thing. And I owe it. Um, I was going to say two things. One about your Twitter. I love how, I mean, every coach is like this. That coaches at college, but you are very excited about Minnesota state. I love that about your tweets. You are very about it. I love that because some are some they all are when you coach where you coach especially in college i feel like they're all excited don't get me wrong your stick out for some reason i don't know why but it sticks out and i love it i think that's what draws people to liking your stuff is because of how positive you are you talk about how like it's the best place in the country and you believe it and we can yeah. tell you believe it no matter what so i think that's that speaks volumes to you of how you promote the school and it brings eyes to that school, actually. So that's why I think I think that's why you have a big Twitter following. Online coaches have a great Twitter following. Number one, number two, I think that I think that big positivity is like this guy is positive, loves the school. We're gonna follow him. Um, 
I'm going back to about me. I tweet stupid things all the time. I get in arguments with people that I shouldn't, and that rubs people the wrong way. I've made I've had coaches unfollow me not because I've argued with them, but because I've argued something else, or I tweet something that is annoying, or a podcast topic I do which is stupid. Like I'll fight. I'm a big Illinois fan. Obviously, I have University of Illinois behind me. I get arguments with people over Brad Underwood and want him fired, and I'll get on there and discuss people and. You know, so I say stupid things. I think that's what people don't like, I guess. But I'm at a point now where I'm like, well, I want to make people happy, obviously. Like they come on this podcast, whoever comes on here, I want to make happy. I want to get along with them, blah, 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 blah. People that I don't know, I don't care. I'm like, it, it is what it is. Whatever. Yeah. I, yeah. For one, I'll start with this Illinois in hiring Brett Bielema is a heck of a hire. Mm hmm. I was recruited by him when he was at Wisconsin and, you know, he's the only coach, you know, I was recruited by a lot of the big 10 schools. He's the only coach that knew who I was and who my dad was and every visit that we came on. Wow. Like he, teams, he knew, and it wasn't like somebody was standing next to him. Like he, he genuinely, like, I think he's a heck of a recruiter. Um, so I think that standpoint is huge. I, I it, it's something where, like Illinois is, I'm a Wisconsin fan, so I'll, I'll kind of leave that alone after that. <laughs> so, that aspect, but from uh, going back to your like Twitter comments, I I think I've only known how to do it as me. Like I'm not trying to be somebody that's not me, um, but also I think it's really really easy to be generally in love with the university that I'm working at when you've been through the tough days of playing mm -hmm. and days of you know the transition from the ncc to the nsic that we had in 2007 2008 when coach hoffman was hired in 2008 of having the north dakotas and the south dakotas and all those schools in our conference that go d1 to uh not you know now it's known as a great conference but at that time the switchover was was something that was like oh you're just going to this conference that is the let in that's a midwest conference what people don't understand is Wisconsin, and this doesn't get enough, I don't want to say publicity, but it doesn't get enough um, talk about Wisconsin has one scholarship school, and that's the University of Wisconsin. And there are, and Wyoming's doing a really good job th these days with Coach Polisek of, you know, he, he came from Iowa and was the old line coach, so he understands the Midwest. But Wisconsin's such an under recruited state that. I, I think it, it just hasn't taken off over the years. And, you know, me being a Wisconsin guy, I came to Minnesota State. I, I And if you've, you know, I'd love to have you up for a game. You know, if you ever need tickets, let me know. I'll put you on the will, the, the will call. Um, but I, I think, you know, Minnesota State is, is such a university that has the facilities that, you know, guys that want to have that Division One experience, that they see it, they get it. They, once they're here, they understand it. And that's, that's where I, you know, I committed to Wisconsin as a PWO out of high school. And, you know, Mankato, Coach Honeyham, who's the offensive line coach in Northwest Missouri State now, kept calling me, kept calling me, kept calling me. I was like, I don't even know where Mankato is. And I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. It's four hours away. And it, it was something where, you know, Mankato is just something that isn't known by Wisconsin kids. And I, I really strive to, you know, kind of introduce – that to them because I think it's such a hidden gem that mm -hmm. um, has the the indoor practice facilities. It has all grass practice fields. It has all grass playing fields. It has a D1 practice facility with basketball. It has the weight room um, that that you need to be successful. And when you have all those things, it, it makes it really really easy to love this place. And that's why I've I've stayed here. My wife's from Mankato, so she'll kill me if. Uh, <laughs> I, I always tell her if the Badgers call, I'm gone. Like we need to go to Madison. But okay. other than that, um, Mankato it has a very special place in my in my heart, and you know my family still comes to a lot of the games, almost all of them at home. And like I always tell my mom, she's she's the ultimate super fan. She's she moved up to Westfield, Wisconsin. Um, you know after we all all three of us boys moved out and. Um, she comes by and, you know, kind of watches all the games. I'm like, mom, I just jump around the sidelines and, you know, I don't do like 
it's very similar to my playing days. Like, yeah, I'd hang on the sidelines a lot. I'd get in the game every once in a while, but um, like you, you don't have to come up. She's like, I to go from playing aspect to coaching here, it, it the memories kind of just keep going. And I think that's the coolest thing for me of, you know, kind of just continue to live, um, you know, this life of, of coaching here after playing here. And I truly do love here. I, I'm not a I'm a person that says, Hey, I love this place when I don't. Um, and I thought that when I went to Upper Iowa too, I, I, I thought there were great people down there. The, the facilities um, from a, a stadium standpoint and weight room were awesome. You know, it's just that the town was a little bit difficult to recruit to, but also to keep people there, but great people. And, I'm a, I'm I'm a huge believer in in being around good people and um you know kind of when you find those people that you uh, believe in and want to be around it's it's really really easy to to love that place and and Coach Hoffer has been here since since my sophomore year and he's been a huge asset for me of you know supporting me but also believing in me and um you know being a guy that allows me to be the offensive line coach here is is crazy to me that um, he would even. Um, consider that after um, you know me playing here but also the interactions I've had with him over the years is I owe a lot to that man well I was getting ready to ask how recruiting was there but you kind of nailed it where you want to open up the world to Minnesota State and that's where Twitter comes in that's that's huge like I found the longer I've coached high school and especially the podcast there's colleges I never heard of there's colleges I don't know about and I've learned them through meeting people and hearing their stories and where they've played and where they've been. So like I knew Minnesota State because of you, like seeing you on Twitter, I was like, I know that place now. Or I talked to other coaches and then I realized how little I know, like around the country or I coached at this school or this school. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Where is that? Oh yeah. That's in this state. Or uh, I recruit from here to go like, it, it's just like, I don't know. Like, you know, when you're in high school, you just know the big 10 cause you live in Illinois or, you know, this, you know, this, I learned all the division three schools cause they always want you to play there no matter whatever. Then I learned, you know, division one double X. I played one year. I walked on at EIU, got my butt kicked and I was done. Like, that was... <laughs> you know me the next Tony Romo or what? No, I was so, <laughs> I was too small. Yeah, was six five, two seventy five, and I was too small. Like that yeah. was just not going to work out. Um, and you played so, but like for me, I was a whole different beast of a thing. And I was like, I'll, I'll be straight up. I was mentally weak. I was like, I cannot do this. Like I, this is not. So that's why I stopped and started coaching. I've been coaching since I was nineteen, and I'm thirty two. Like, yeah. and so I feel old. Like I'm not old. But coaching wise, I feel old. So, like, for example, if he listens to this, I apologize. It's nothing bad. The freshman, I'm the freshman B baseball coach. So, you know, I just do my B bombers and, and we go off. The freshman A coach, he's 25 years old and I'm 32. Yep. So, he really teaches me like the baseball stuff because that was his thing. I help him kind of with other aspects like how should we handle this or, you know, how do we, when we cut kids, like, how do we do, like, like I help them with that type of stuff or like, Hey, a parent called me and I got to like, tell him like, so I'm like, I'm like Yoda back there. Like, Hey, this is, it's okay. <laughs> and I'm also a nerd. So I like all those other yeah. things. Like I have a segment on this podcast called geek corner where me and my friend talk about Marvel the entire time. Cause I'm a big nerd. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. I oh, love well, it. I'm a nerd. I see Marvel movies the nights they come out, and then me and him talk about them. Like, it's just this big nerd yeah. fest. My wife's got me into that. Like, I, I used to not be into that. And my wife kind of loves that stuff. And, you know, you do whatever the wife says to make it, you know, everything happy. And so I got into that stuff and started watching it. And um, she loves that stuff. I, I, I've grown uh, very fond of that because, you know, my, I remember, I was, remember my, like my dad used to read us the Harry Potter books and we watch them and all that stuff. And I just never, I was always a sports guy. I was always a mm -hmm. guy that watched whatever sports was on, on TV. And she's kind of opened up that, that aspect of, 
uh, movies and stuff like that. So that's been pretty cool to, to watch and take in because it's, it's pretty interesting. It's it's action packed, as as most would say. Well, I was the same. I was sports, but I watched action movies. I watched superhero movies. But you kind of kept that to yourself. Like it was just kind of like whatever. And then the past couple years before COVID even, I was like, screw it. I don't care who knows. I'm old now. I'm whatever. I don't care. Uh, Then COVID hit and then you had way more time on your hands. So blah, 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 blah. Started this podcast. My buddy goes, hey, you know, I can come on and we'll talk. So we talked and he goes, hey, what if we just talked about Marvel stuff all the time or whatever? And I was like, perfect. That's the problem with me. Like I can't watch like law. So I'm a law enforcement major and I was a police officer for, you know, almost two years when I moved back home after I graduated from college. And like, I watch law enforcement movies and it's like, like, why is that guy's finger on the trigger? Or like, why, why, like, I, I, my family's tell like, they can't watch law enforcement movies with me because I'll just critique it the whole time. Cause it's just, so like, I, <laughs> I've kind of moved on. I can't watch anything law enforcement movies unless it's like the town. The town's a great movie uh, with okay. Ben Affleck. I'm a big fan of that one, but. There aren't many cop movies out there I can watch and, you know, it's going through the training and the aspects of, you know, being a cop and that sort of thing. Kind of was like, oh man, I, this is so unrealistic. I can't handle it. So I'm, but that, that's the coach of me, right? You always want to coach people to, to be the doing things right and, and by the book, but um, that's a little by standard of uh, being a law enforcement major with that one. I was going to say, what an interesting uh, churn to to be a cop for a little bit, then go into into coaching. Oh yeah, I uh, so I was I'm over five in foot pursuits, so that was that was tough. You know, it, it being off as a lineman in college, like my foot speed's never been good. Um, <laughs> the you know my best story of of responding to a you know noise complaint in Wanakee, Wisconsin, which is a northwest suburb of Madison. And, showing up and there's about 300 kids in the background or in the backyard of a school after a you know graduation party. And I'm literally standing there like, Oh man, I got to chase these kids. And uh-huh. you know, I, I, I picked the the slowest kid that I possibly think that I could catch. And this was the smartest slow kid ever. Um, he ran a zigzag, um, which also, I don't know if you've ever had somebody run from you in a zigzag, you also run in zigzag. Right. Without no- um, the kid got away. Um, we caught three, kids that night and two were by the bike cop so that was a that was a low point in my um cop career but it was it, from a law enforcement standpoint it was it was tough for me to to get used to nights and um you know being able to do that job and um be successful and seeing myself doing that for a long time and that, that kind of comes in where the coaching why i'm doing coaching now is is you know i was when I moved home, I was a, a middle school coach for four years. I did seventh grade, eighth grade, and then moved back to seventh grade, eighth grade. So I had the same years, same kids for two years. And uh, after that, got into to high school and at the same time had a, my full time job of, you know, I was a, I, I got into sales. I did, I sold construction and ag equipment in Southwest Wisconsin and went farm to farm and asking guys if they needed skid steers and wheel loaders and that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, found myself waking up most mornings, like checking to see how many sick days I had and, <laughs> you know, can I call in sick? And, um, you know, I've always, you know, my mom and dad always did a really good job raising me of, of making me understand that I want to do things that I love to do. Um, and, you know, chase those dreams and, and do things that you can see yourself doing for the rest of your life. And that's where this came in. You know, I ended up being, I was a head, in 2017, I was a head coach for a eight-man program after we won a state championship. And, um, you know, I, it was it was still a point where, you know, I wanted to do football all the time. And, you know, I sold my house and sold <laughs> pretty much everything I had and moved up to Minnesota State and Mankato and um, lived off $7,000 a year for two years and kind of <laughs> just tried to pay the bills with my side job and, um, you know, going off profits of the things I had sold and I was all in. And, you know, I think a lot of people need to understand that you aren't stuck doing what you're doing. You you need to chase the things that you want to do. 
because you only get one life. You only get one chance to be you and, and do the things you love to do. And that's where I'm so fortunate to have coach Hoffner and, and, you know, him giving me an opportunity to come back, but also from a standpoint of, of hiring me as a full-time coach and, and really allowing me to do this full-time and, and support my family. And, um, you know, I think that hard work pays off and, you just have to bet on yourself sometimes and you have to do things that, that other people probably aren't comfortable doing, but comfortable isn't, um, you know, kind of what, what you're going to achieve in life. If you, if you're comfortable, if you're, if you're just okay doing what you're doing, I, I think that you're going to find yourself disappointed in, in what you want to do in the long run. So that's always been my kind of philosophy of, um, kind of chasing this dream that I'm, <laughs> it's crazy. It's this dream that I'm living now. And, you know, I couldn't imagine, you know, being anywhere else. And, and that's the cool thing, again, that, if, you know, I'm, I've, I've had, you know, many job offers over the years and, you know, I've turned a lot of them down because I love this university. And I, I you know, I love, I, I, I tell this to Coach Hoffman all the time because we always, you know, at least once a year we have one-on-one -on -one meetings. We've been in the national title twice in the last 10 years. I need to win a national title. I remember in 2014 when Mankato played, uh, CSU Pueblo and I was sitting in my grandparents basement and I remember watching the game and um, I think it was 14 and 13 and nothing that they lost and you know I, I felt gut wrenched for the guys that those guys that were playing those games were freshmen when I was senior and like how much it affected me and so like that's kind of where I got into it and then 2018 I came into a team that was already, already really good and you know we made it to the final four lost to a Ferris State team and then 2019, we went to the national title, played a West Ford team. And the experience that I got to, you know, experience as a coach here going through that, it fueled that even more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, flying out of Texas, having the, the barbecue in Texas, uh, <laughs> boy, like brisket at Hutchins Barbecue in McKinney, Texas is, I've never had better barbecue. And so just for that, it, like, I love football. I love winning football. But just for the barbecue alone, I need to make it back to the national title. Uh, <laughs> I would have those, uh, you know, brisket ribs, the the side mac and cheese, like oh boy, like it's it's something where it's it it fuels me, and I I I think that you know I have a really good group that's that's sophomores right now that are going to be juniors. Um, I lose one guy next year. I lost one guy last year. All those guys being back, and you know, I've got first team all conference left tackle that. You know, I, I've told that I'm committed to him, and you know, I think that my word is really, really important to those kids. And um, you know, I want to be around to, to see their successes and and be around for the next couple of years, and um, then we can kind of reevaluate where I'm at. But from a standpoint of you know, I need to win a national title. Is is you know, I think of like growing up in the in the Midwest, you see the the Whitewater teams and seeing mm -hmm. those guys national title after national title after national title. It's that that to have that happen here would be a dream in a lifetime um, to experience, and that's what kind of fuels me to to continue to coach here and and see how far we can take this thing. Well, I hope you get there, though. Um, I wanted to oh, go back out of McKinney. I'm telling you what it's 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 a it's a heck of an experience. Well, when you I, I Google mapped it, you're six hours from me. That's not bad. Oh, not at all. We got, we got some, we got a, I got a two Illinois kids that are coming from online. Um, um, Sam Morgan, um, he's, he's from down the Illinois range and, um, uh, Warsaw. Um, he's, I forget what town he's from, but we haven't really gotten into the Illinois O line guys over the last couple of years, but this last year we finally started tapping into it. I think, um, coach Coops at, at Greenfield's really kind of put me on a lot of guys and, um, you know, there's a lot of high school coaches that have, have, you know, vouched for their guys and, um, it's, it's starting to open up a little bit bigger than just like the Wisconsin. Uh, we've done a really good job in Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, and the Dakotas have been really good to us two years ago. I had, I had three guys that took from South Dakota and, um, unfortunately, so this is probably one of the, the most. Um, you know, kind of centralizing moments in my college career as coaching of 
you know, I, last year I lost one of my commits died a week before camp. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was a guy that, you know, I talked to him on the phone a couple hours before he died and you know, it was just in a car accident in the middle of South Dakota. And, um, somebody ran a, a stop sign and, you know, kind of T-boned him. And, um, you know, I think from a standpoint of relationships are really, really big for, for me. And, mm-hmm. you know, my guys are, are like kids, like I have them out to the house for barbecues. You know, I take them ice fishing. Um, we, we do things outside of football and, that's kind of been one of the things that has kind of, you know, set me back and, and made me realize how important my relationships are with these guys. And, um, you know, his mom and dad are still really, really close. And, and you, you just never understand when life is going to call you to um, your greater purpose. And, you know, I think from that standpoint of, you know, seeing the recruiting in all aspects of Minnesota and the Midwest and that sort of thing. But you also get to learn so much more about so many kids throughout the Midwest and and getting those guys to understand what Minnesota State's about and having them buy in. And um, that was that was a really tough thing to, to kind of go through as as a as not only as a coach, but as a room, as a staff. Um, I'm not sure that I hope that never happens, you know, to, to me or anybody else out there as a coach again. But um, I really think it makes you centralize and understand what you're doing it for, mm-hmm. but also, you know, kind of bring the guys that are around you in together closer to realize, Hey, this is, you never know when your time's going to come. And, and this is all, even from a football standpoint, from an injury standpoint, from a, you know, all that stuff, it, you never understand when it's all done. Football is not something you play at 40, 50 years old. Mm-hmm. It's not like golf that you just get to play for the rest of your life. And, um, you know, I really try to remind those guys over and over again that that that's the key. And um, it, it's, I love the guys I'm around now. I got um, 14 guys that are in my room right now, and uh, which is a little bit more than I usually have after graduating class. And um, it, it, I'm really, really excited about the future here at Minnesota State. Well, I remember, I think that's when you're supposed to come on here, and then that happened. I remember that because you texted me that. And I, and I think that's why I stopped asking you. I was like, that is a horrific thing of not going to mess with it again, because that's, like you said, there's more important things than football. Like, so like a person's life is way more important than football. It's way more important than, than anything else. I remember when that happened. So face to face kind of at zoom is sorry for everybody's loss, you know, yep, for sure. um, but like we were talking before we recorded and I won't repeat everything I said, you do do a lot for kids and you try to do the best you can. But one thing I heard a long time ago, and maybe cause I'm an ass, you can't save them all, I guess but yeah. you do the best you can. Um, and then I think sports is the best way to build relationships. Like I said, this podcast talking to right now, we have not talked one. So I'm going to talk you off like one minute. Yeah. When I started this, I would have anxiety over doing it because how do you intro a podcast? I have no clue. Like, Hey, welcome <laughs> back. Here's whatever. I don't know. How do you end it? You'll hear this. When I end it, you're going to be like, that's the stupidest thing ever because I don't know how to end it. <laughs> and then how do you go about doing it? Because people like topics, people like questions, people like whatever. But then I would panic because I like how I have to research this person, which is cool. You research them. But then if like an interview, like if I asked you a question, you answered it. But in your two minute answer, you said something I found interesting so I go off of that. But then I look at my paper and I go, but we're not going in order the way I thought. I got to somehow get back to this. So then it was Coach Coach McPherson, Coach Mack. It was like the first time I didn't have anything written down. And it went great. It became like, he goes, I like WWE. I like golf. And nobody knows that. Like, I'm a person. And so then I realized... I'll have topics. I might ask them a question about run game, pass game, whatever. But if it turns into a conversation, that's why I call myself Sports Joe Rogan because it just kind of goes. You know what I mean? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I think the coolest thing for me of like I've been on other podcasts in the past and it's got question after question. Like I'd rather just like have a conversation with people. Like this is I'm not trying to like answer your question to the perfect answer. I'm just trying to like have a conversation with you. And yeah. I think from 
again, from our, our relationship over the years of understanding who you are and, you know, allowing me to be myself and that's who I want to be in, in all aspects of life. And whether it's coaching or whether I'm at the grocery store, like I, this is, this is kind of the conversation that I'd rather have than, Hey, how's this? How do you run uh, this gap scheme with uh, power? Or how you know? Hey, you run inside zone here. Are you a flow zone? Are you mid zone? Are you a, a wide zone? Are you taking? Are you combo? Like, I get that. That I would love. You know, chopping it up and talking football is one thing, but from a standpoint of having conversations with one man to another, of um, you know, what truly means the most to us is more valuable than this. Like everybody runs the same schemes. Everybody, we we could talk zone schemes, gap schemes, pass pro, sprint out, draws, screens, all that stuff till we're blue in the face. But can can you have a conversation from person to person and talk about the things that are important to them? Is that's that is so rare? It's it's unbelievable. Well, I'm going to erase the the question I have for run game. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, ask what. <laughs> It's, I just, I love no. this, like, of you just allowing me to talk because it's, I, I could talk for hours and you know, I'll talk a year off and, and that sort of thing. But that's where Twitter comes in, right? I just talk whatever I say I want to say and hopefully my head coach doesn't yell at me. So there's a lot of things I'm going to bring up that you said, but one thing I don't, you probably didn't see it because again, I'm not big, I'm not a big popular Twitter person. I'm not whatever. I'll never forget. I drew up a play on huddle, screenshot it, put it on Twitter because I honestly did not know how to run duo because that was just a blind spot I had. Like, I don't understand it, but I was that person that said, well, wait a minute. I'm double teaming on inside zone. So I was just curious. It wasn't me trying to, I honest to goodness was not being a jerk at this point in time. And I put a picture up and I said, is this your inside zone? Is this your duo? And goodness gracious, I had so many comments. It was probably the most commented thing I've ever put of people yelling at me for saying that it's not inside zone or it's not duo. The way the running back's running is this, 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 and this. And it, I think it might have been during COVID. And I think that's when I realized, oh, we all hate each other right now. And that's where the air raid wing T started to pop up. Yep. Now that that. One, that one I jumped in on because... I was friends with people that ran the wing T and air raids. So I was like, I could stir the pot in both directions. Yeah. yeah, right. What was COVID? We weren't coaching Illinois. We didn't play football till spring of 2021. So it was like, what are we going to do? So I was stirring the pot a little bit. Um, <laughs> I love stir. I, I I love stirring the pot just to to kind of stir the pot with you. But yeah, uh, what's better than that, right? It starts more conversation. Right. Well, different. Until, well, until I do something like that, where I honestly put on there, like, guys, I'm just honestly curious. And I think they thought I was like being sarcastic yeah. and people just out of the woodwork. And so I said, OK, so so I, I honestly realized, like, OK, I know nothing, so I need to learn it. And so then I have to be politically correct on everything even just football plays, I can't just whatever. So I, I personally have gotten careful. If someone actually posts something like that, I will. If I comment, I go, I call this this, instead of saying no, this is what it is. You know, like I have to be careful with that. So I'll say like, I call this ISO. To somebody else, they might say, Oh, I call this lead. And I'm like, perfect. That's what you call it. But then there's people that say, no, that's stupid. This is what this is called. And that's when I start stirring the pie. Well, as soon as I see something like that, I go, well, now I got to stir it a little bit. Well, I think that's tough of like, you look at inside zone, just the inside zone. There are 10 plus ways for you to run it. Mm -hmm. Like let's say this is the best way to do it. This is how you call it. Like, Man, even me and my head coach have, you know, we butt heads from time to time. Like, he'll say it's this, and I say it's like, who, who is anybody to say that it's this, that it's when it comes down to it, it's what the path of the running back is, one. But what, what, what is the rules of the O line up front? And I think 
even if you have the same scheme, it can still be called something different. And so uh -huh. I think if, if people understand that everybody's trying to teach one thing or the other, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's football. Football is, is that's to me why it's so cool. If you can, you can name it so many different things, whether it's, you know, even, I think the biggest thing, getting away from the run game stuff, just routes. You know, yes. like, I, Evan, like I hear nine different things for the same route that I hear. Like it's, it, it is, who, who's to say that this is how you call it? This, yeah, that's how you teach it. But you can never, ever, say you're wrong to somebody else that they're calling it something different because whether that's something that they taught they learned they they that's just how they do things it doesn't matter it's football is football as long as you get the job done it, it doesn't matter what you call it it's how you teach it and how you you know, kind of respect the people that you're around that you're teaching too i i've never been that's it. it's funny you say that like i'm talking to like oh somebody draws this up i I have exclusively tried to never comment on any of those just because I know whatever I say, whether I believe it or not, or whether I've been taught by this person or that person, it's going to be wrong in somebody's eyes. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't matter my logic. It doesn't matter my teaching. It doesn't matter where I learned it from. It doesn't matter how long I've learned it. Somebody's going to have something to say that's different than, you know, what they think it is. So, those those type of people can you know just kind of live in their their zones, and I think that kind of goes back to you know always learning and always understanding what other people understand and other people teach because nobody's perfect, nobody knows everything, um, myself included. I am so far away from knowing anything about being an expert or knowing everything about pass pro or run blocking or pass. You know, it's just. The, the the second and my hub coach always says this is you know the second that you think you know everything is the second that you you know just been passed up by somebody else that's trying to learn more mm -hmm. and doesn't matter what you call it as long as you're a good teacher and, and can teach people the the basic rules of this that and the other thing and let the people argue what you call it all day long as long as it works it works yeah well that's <clears throat> when i started doing this podcast and talking to coaches i quickly realized how little i knew but then I quickly realized, like, I actually, like, overdosed on football because, like I told you, Banstro, Coach Banstro, I don't know if you ever talked to him, he went full go, and I remember one time, he goes, yeah, I interviewed, like, 10 coaches this week. And I was like, what? Well, well I'm going to do that. So all that summer, I just kept talking and talking. Like, I would do three in a day, four in a day, talk to coaches, and I loved it. It got to a point, though, where I was, like, almost overdosed on, like, what was said to me. Like, if you listen to Joe Rogan, he'll forget what he talked to people about, and it started to happen. I started to be like, I don't remember what they said. I, You know, I, I don't remember everything, so I actually had to stop. So when football season came back around, I was like, I'm not going to podcast right now. You know, I overdosed, but I quickly realized how little I knew. I can't I think, take it away. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. I just put it in a toolbox somewhere. Like, guys' brains, I got told this one time by a coach I no longer talk to. We hate each other. But I took this from him. <laughs> Let's just say he taught me what not to do. But anyway, he said, guys' minds are like garages. Like, we put stuff in boxes, put it away. Now, we don't remember what's in that box all the time. Or we don't know remember where we put the box. But it's there. But then when we actually need it, it will click with us and we know where it is. You know, like I had to throw that in there. Like a coach that taught me nothing taught me that. We understand what the label says on the box. We may not know what's in the box, but we, we're going to act like it's – we know everything and every content in that box. Just ask mm -hmm. my wife. <laughs> She'll contest that all day long. Oh, I do that She'll, too. But... The dishes are done upstairs right now too, so – the longer we can make this podcast go, the less dishes I have to do. So um, I, I'm here all night. I, I do have practice in the morning, but um, I, I'm my bedtime isn't until late. So we can go as long as you want. That was the other part of the podcast. How long do you go until the other person says stop? Right, exactly. Over? Yeah, if some guys want to be done in and out in 15, 20. Some guys can talk their best of the night. And, um, I'm a guy that 
I could talk till it till you tell me to stop. So, well, I was gonna say like this office in here. It's a mess, but it's like my mess. But at least I know where the stuff is. So when like when I go to get it, I'm like, I know where it is. Now when we clean and stuff gets moved, then I need to find out. Like, well, wait a minute, where was it? Like we clean now, I moved it. Now where where the hell did I put it? You know, like if I would have just kept it there, I could find you it. You know what? Do what? What the box looks like, though. You yeah. Just don't know. Well, like. It, you just don't know exactly where you. It could be under another box. Right. And so. But don't worry. It's always the last place I look. So let's. Yeah. yeah because self consciously, you've been like, okay, I'm going to put it here. I'll never forget that it's here. But then you put a bunch of stuff on top of it because you also think, hey, if I'm going to look for something, I'm going to put it here. Well, you're not going to look at the bottom box because you also don't think that, hey, I wouldn't put something on the bottom box that I really wanted, right? It's just like, it, it's life in general, right? You always, there's things in my head, I guarantee, that are stacked below, um, you know, things on things on things that I, I thought that I would never need to, or at least would love to regurgitate, regurgitate to you and it's gone forever and it's it's in boxes i'd have to open those suckers up and that, that would take way too long that's what happened to me last summer maybe when that happened i don't remember see i can't remember when but they did a box in your head you don't even know it it literally got to a point where like okay here's how this person runs gt here's this passing game here's this here's this here's this blocking scheme here's this then i start talking to defensive guys well here's this 3 4 here's this here's this here's this here's this and then i would have conversations with people where it was no football then i really needed that marvel talk cuz it got me out of it then i really needed my two buddies that i grew up with to hop on here and talk like illinois basketball or football to like bring it back but then right after that all right, I gotta go talk to this coach and do blah, 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 da, 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 da. And it got to the point where I was like, I want to run all of it. When I got hired as a run game coordinator, I was like, I want all of it. I want all yeah. this footwork. I want everything I've seen. And then you put it on paper and you go, well, I forgot what he said about this. Yeah. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, this is not meant for a freshman in high school, so we're not going to do this. This isn't even meant for a senior who is – getting their brand new O-line run game coordinator to come in and tell them to do this. Like the high school I was at, they never had a true O-line coach. Like oh our head coach now, he don't listen to this, but if he does, he knows what I mean. He coached O-line, but he played linebacker in college. So yeah. I had asked him when I came in, I was like, so what did you do? And he was like, uh, I just told him to run and hit the person. I was like, okay. <laughs> Which can work. I don't don't get me wrong. It can work. That, it can. That can be a great uh, schematic way to do things. Or like, well, another example. I came in and I'm like, I'm a skip pull person on power because they want to run power. And I said, fine, but I'm a skip pull person because. Well, let me tell you about my life. I grew up 20 minutes east of Illinois, like University of Illinois, in Central Illinois. Went to EIU. My now fiance is from the suburbs of Chicago. So she she got a job up here in 2018. So happy life. You know, we go to the yep. suburbs. Yep. Country boy of high school of 300, now up in the suburbs. <laughs> so I, where EIU is located, it's Charleston, Illinois. Um, I coach at the high school there. I was a 24, 25-year-old offensive coordinator, blah, 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 blah. So you really thought you knew everything. And that's what I mean by stirring the pot. Like if I had, I had Twitter back then, but Twitter wasn't what it is now. Right. If you took Twitter from then to now, I would have been in trouble because I would have said, <laughs> I know more than you, like, this is dumb, whatever. But in 2018, the, I had a falling out with the coaches there, like the whole thing. And I basically said, I'll never coach again. That's how bad it was. It was such a bad experience. I said, I'm never doing this again, ever. Yep. But when we came up here, um, where I coach baseball at, not football, their high school is right off the street. So you see that high school during the summer, they're practicing. You see another high school and, and you start doing this. You're like, I got to be around football. Like, I got I to gotta do something. So the school I went and coached at, 
I showed up at the right time. We went nine and zero, ten and zero. Then we saw East St. Louis the second round. And we were like, well, there, the, it's over after that. But the way he did things is the way I wanted to do it. So I left that high school, went to a different high school. Then the high school I'm at now for football anyway. I said, I want to skip pole. I want to double team on inside zone, blah, 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 blah. So when I came in with skip pole, I said, what'd you guys do on power? And he goes, uh, we just turned and ran and hit. And I was like, no, we're going to skip pole. We're going to. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> and I said, was that the linebacker in you talking when you did that? He goes, yeah, I just wanted him to get up there. And I was like, nope, skip pole. We are going to skip pole. But what's crazy about our head coach is if I show him this footwork stuff, he'll ask me why. And I'll show him or tell him why. And he goes, I like it. Since I have a reason of why, like, why are you skip pulling, Steve? And I said, well, I want them to be square. I want them to see what's going on. I want them to be able to plant their foot and go, you know, or like, why are you double team on inside zone? I thought inside zone was just stepping this way, stepping this way. And I said, well, I want to make sure that this, I'm not dealing with a big old line. I said, I want to make sure that this big defensive lineman doesn't shoot through the gap. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, or like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And so since I can justify it and he's not an offensive guy, he goes, okay. Like, but all the stuff I learned, I brought in and some things are like, where'd you get that? I'm like, well, I got it from coach Rudolph or I got it from here. So now I can like the relationships yep. I built, I can go back to that and say, well, I got it from this person. Then I can credit that person and say, I didn't do it. They did, you know? Yeah. I think that's big. Like nobody in especially these days nobody's inventing anything and i think that you you find the niches and and what works best for you and um you know i, I was very fortunate to learn from coach prosser who is the offensive coordinator at wayne state now in nebraska of um i try to teach whether it's a zone scheme or a gap scheme it's the same all mm -hmm. i'm i i could start twitter fights with everybody out there on gap schemes on you got this, that, you know, gap schemes are all the same. It's whether you're pulling one, two, you're double teaming, it's all the same. And so whether you're, a, especially in our scheme, if you're a center, guard, or tackle, I teach everything the same. Whether you're down blocking, whether you're double teaming, or you're pulling, those are the three things you can do. Or if you're the backside step engine. Um, and so I try to teach everybody the same from an aspect of what their footwork is, how we're doing things in double teams. All double teams are the same for me. Whether it's a vertical double team or a working backside double team, we always have a lift guy. We always have a drive guy. Um, you know, when I came back in 2018, I learned a lot about bucket steps. And to me, I was like, we're going to take backward steps to like, that was like earth shattering to me. Cause I, my, you know, my white coach would kill me if I ever stepped backwards and mm -hmm. You know, trying to like just teach those guys how to do that. And I've kind of evolved to more lateral rather than backwards and like the whole lose ground to gain ground thing in, in zone schemes. But I also think it, it matters what kind of zone schemes you're running. Um, but for me, it's always been to try to simplify how their rules are because at, at the college level, for me, of like all these guys came here and they're all scholarship players, like what they did to get here. I don't need to reinvent what they did, right? Uh -huh. And they're all really good athletes. They're all really big human beings. Some of them bigger than others. Some need to gain weight when they get to here. Some need to lose weight. But teach them all the same. And, you know, we do things a little bit differently here. As, you know, I play 78 old linemen every game. And it, it, it we call them kind of rotational starters. So we have our, our starting five. And then we have, you know, our two to three guys that we think that um, could start a lot of other places. And that's really helped me kind of develop the younger guys, but also keep my top five who I think are the best five um, healthy. And, um, and that's, that's really important from a, a organization that, you know, is predominantly playing in the playoffs, um, but also developing those other younger guys to the standard of which we ask them to do things. So, it, it doesn't matter if you play tackle, guard, or center. We all treat it the same for their technique standpoint. And, you know, I, I try to keep it as simple as possible of, you know, I think, you know, sitting in a lot of places and doing in-services and going to clinics and talking to guys and listening to guys, I think 
there are so many people that try to complicate things so much and you know you need to call this that this that the other thing you need to teach it this way like i'm trying to do this the simplest way possible so that my guys play fast there's very little little communication because they've done it so much in practice and they can play fast play to their athletic ability and use their natural ability to block people and i think that's also from a standpoint of i'm really lucky in the standpoint of being at mankato and and having some of the best offensive linemen come here that you know if you aren't going d1 even you know i've <laughs> there's guys you know i think of colin selk from columbus wisconsin who had you know d1 offers and turned those down to come play for me of um the relationship that i was able to build with him of that's really real the relationship standpoint is really really important to me and um, seeing those guys, you know, be committed to come in here and play football, but also for them to understand that they're going to be taught in a very simple way. I'm not going to overcomplicate things and just let them play fast because I think fast is, is a very um, fast is, is so much more. It's so much more difficult to defend rather than, Hey, I took this perfect first step, this perfect second step, like, uh, something I've kind of learned over the years of, you know, kind of treating zone and gap the same, no matter what the scheme is and just treat it all the same and, and have them work on that over and over again. My, my guys kind of give me crap all the time. They're like, Hey, you got any other uh, indie drills? I'm like, I got, I got about 12 and like, I got about six run game, about three zone, three gap. I got about three pass pro three whether it be because i teach three different passes too so i teach um like a i call it a snap set or a quick set i call you know an angle set and learn that um, um this pass off season from um one of the uh i'd have to look and see where i got it from but like setting an angle i i was always you know kind of taught whether it be a snap set or a vertical set and kind of got in trouble with some guys always a vertical setting and um, you know, I think always learning from other guys that have done it for a long time and, and teaching it simple so you don't overcomplicate things and let kids, you know, kind of think what they should do or shouldn't do and just let them play. I think that's the most misconception thing at the college level or even high school level. Let kids play and just teach them the very bare essentials to be successful and um, you can kind of teach all that. Yeah, I didn't mean to get on to the scheme part. No, oh, you're good. I love that shit. I, I love it a lot. Um, I think you made a couple of good points because, like, I know you're not dealing with it in college, but I'm dealing with, like, a small O-line. But my mindset is always, we're double teaming or we're doing this. you got to drive them off the ball, and that's always the mentality. This year, or this coming season, <clears throat> I have every old line coming back. I had no seniors. They were all juniors. Thanks. And I'm going to come in with the mindset of, I'm still going to tell them to be tough and all that stuff, but I think I'm going to praise more if we get in their way. I don't need to drive them three yards off the ball. If I get in their way and the running back makes a good play or, or this, I have to praise that more because I have to adjust to what they're doing. Now in college, maybe you don't have to do that. You know, some are dealing with 300 pound people like, oh, I'm dealing with 200 pound, you know, like I don't, I don't have the luxury of the, I don't know what we were talking about it, the six, six, 285 pound that should be playing. Like I don't have that type of thing. So I'm going into it this season with, no way, we're going to work on basic footwork. But I'm not going to get crazy. And when I teach inside zone, I actually say, protect the gap. I don't say the area or the zone. I always say protect the gap like that's how we know when we're covered uncovered like is he head up in the gap well, we're covered because that's what we're protecting if it's backside don't worry about it that's that person unless he's calling for help like that type of thing because how can i make it easy um oh if i keep doing all this footwork so like this year it's going to be like quick step and the gallop like that's really all i need you know so it's just funny how you said that because I always think I fall back to what I know or what should be done. You know, like if I talk to college coaches, this is what it should quote unquote be done. But then I'll watch high schools. We play a high school. And if you watch their film, they won't block 
the defensive line sometimes. They just straight up won't do it. And the footwork is crazy, but guess what? It works. When they run pin and pull, they don't block the defensive lineman. They just don't. Because their running back is an athlete, so he can just do 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 and go. Well, I think it, it, like what I was talking about, like going back to inside zone, like I very rarely talk about their steps and their hands. I talk about, all right, backside, you need to set a wall. The front side, you need to extend. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I talk about it over and over again. And if they understand the concept of what the play is and where the back's trying to hit it, let them be athletes. Let mm -hmm. them be big men in space that can move people. And especially when you have two on one, let them set walls backside. Let them extend front side and know they have help. You know, as a tackle, you have help from the guard. If it's a shade, you know, to the center. And, you know, I think from that standpoint of, you know, allowing guys to, they don't have to worry about being right or wrong. They just they need to worry about what the overall concept of the play is. You'll get guys to play at a faster level and not have them worry about, oh man, my step needs to be here. I need to do this. My eyes need, to, yeah, it, your eyes are important. Don't get me wrong, but that shouldn't be your utmost important thing that you need to worry about. It's it's the base conception of the play, right? Every play has a base conception. Inside zone, set the wall on the backside, extend front side. Hey, power, let's get a double team on the front side to drive vertical to work to the backside linebacker, and let's pull around and make the back right by covering a guy up by the play side linebacker. That's it. Stop trying to overcomplicate coaching. Uh -huh. Give them a concept of what the play is and let them use their natural ability to play fast. Playing fast exceeds any technique that you can tell a kid to do. I wholeheartedly believe that. If you allow kids to play fast and you allow them to play physical and you allow them to just be free, you're going to have mistakes. Don't get me wrong. But mistakes at full speed playing at their confidence is through the roof is something that I've been really, really blessed to, you know, be around guys that fully buy into that and, and just allow you to coach the basics of what the concept is so that they can play fast and they can do what is asked from a global standpoint. And I, I go back to, you know, I, not every play is going to be a home run. Uh -huh. plays that you get back to the line of scrimmage and it's a plus, right? We, we talk about efficiency a lot in our offense. Efficiency is not losing yards. It's not putting the ball in jeopardy. It's not losing yards. The one to two yard gains, we, we consider body blows. The knockouts come, right? The knockouts come from body blows and, and understanding that not getting, um, you know, not getting discouraged or not getting um, you know, pissed off because you're not getting those touchdown runs over and over again. Those come from body blows and those come from two to three to four to five yard gains and just understanding the playing fast overrides technique. That's something I talk about over and over again. It's something I was, you know, I've kind of learned over the years and, you know, I, I kind of got into it as like, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to make sure they do this. Well, it, it made players play slow and it made players think too much. Um, Football is too fast of a game to have those guys think and play slow. You need to play fast. You need to play confident. You need to play physical. And I don't live with the, the mistakes you make because you're doing that. And I, I, I'm a firm believer in that. And I think also <laughs> kind of goes back to my, um, you know, players win games, not coaches. If it's real easy for me to talk like this, you know, being at Mankato when we get some of the best, you know, athletes that don't go to the division one level, um, get the best players you possibly can, and they're going to win football games, and you know, put them in in positions where they can be free and and play to the best ability. And um, I'm not the best line coach out there. I probably will never be, but. Uh, I've, I've always strived to be somebody that uh, that my guys can come talk to if they you know have issues and um, need somebody to talk to, and I think that's more important to be, than being the best offensive line coach out there is is somebody that that hey I know every little scheme I know every little um, defensive front and blitz and all that sort of stuff. I'd rather be somebody that that allows my guys to play fast, play physical, and 
that's always going to be uh, available to have a conversation off the field and, and help them, you know, become men that they are hopefully today and, you know, invite me to their wedding and, you know, be around in, in their life for, for years and years to come is way, way more important than, um, you know, teaching them a, a six inch bucket step on inside zone. I think there's so many guys at the, the high school and college level that get it confused on why you get into coaching. You get into coaching to to develop young minds and you get into coaching to help people become men and women and and be the best person they could possibly be and, and kind of lean on you for the rest of their lives and, and have somebody that maybe they didn't have in their life before now that they can always come back to to, you know, has a have a, as a resource. And I think that more people need to understand that that coaching just isn't X's and O's. It's not about the Jimmys and the Joes. It's it's about the relationships that you have, and you know, the avenues in which you allow those kids to to become the best of them. And I'll get off my high horse because you know I talk about this a lot with my guys and you know recruits that come in. Uh, I say this a lot, and I, I I get looked crazy by a lot of like kids and and their parents that come in and, and have conversations with and. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that they think I'm full of crap, but I, I, I just, the, the guys that I'm around a lot can vouch for the fact that, uh, I'm, I'm much more into the relationship aspect and, and being a, a person that is there to help them be the best person they can be, um, and allowing them to, to play to their level, um, that I think they can play and, and being there for the rest of their lives and not just understanding that they're, they, you ain't here just to win football games. You're, like we talked about before, I want to win a national title. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I also want to see you, um, you know, get married and, and have a good job and, and be happy in life. And um, that to me is, is just as rewarding as, you know, winning a national title in, at the end. Well, because if you build that relationship, they're going to play no matter what you do. You could go out there and say, we're going to pass 60 times this game and they're going to trust what you're saying no matter what, because they've seen that side. And that's that's how you can coach them hard, too, if they understand that. And when, I don't care what parents say or other coaches say. You're going to yell at coach loudly and, and do this and get hyped up and do whatever. But I always – because I'm, I'm in high school, but I always tell them, like, my older, old, my older linemen with me that have been with me three years, going to be four years, you know, when they were freshmen being around me, it's funny if I get on a – kid that's younger the older guy are like hey but as soon as practice is over you could go up to coach they don't say kachevsky because nobody can say it so it's coach steve like you can go up to coach steve and say and have a normal conversation as you're walking back into the school and he won't even like remember yelling at you or saying like why did you not get to this spot he will literally do that or tomorrow morning if you go up to and say coach how was your morning i Coach, he's going to have a conversation with you like, oh, yeah, how was your bus ride in? What did you have for breakfast? Like, he's not going to sit there and, you know, berate you now. now they, But they will tell you this about me. I might make a joke about it. I might be like, hey, remember when you didn't get to that guy? That was fun. Percent, man. <laughs> I, it, it's it's impossible, right? It, it, you lighten the mood, right? It, it's it's possible not to, to at least poke fun at things. Oh, yeah. Like, in basketball, uh my player got like a technical. So like for the next week I said, Mr. T to him the whole time. And like the kids were making him give him a hard time. Well, then I got a technical. So I was like, well, I got to be quiet now because, uh, so then he started calling me Mr. T for like the next week. And I was like, all right, fair enough. Like it's, but, but he knew he could, he knew because the relationship we were building, like he knew he could do that. Like, and to trust whatever and do all that stuff. And that's kind of how it is with football. Because football is my main sport. I coach all the others, but football is the one. And in football, I can even go to the wide receivers and say whatever. Like, I go over there and be like, oh, remember when you dropped the ball yesterday? And they might, Coach Steve, and then they just do one of these. Or I will have to say, though, too, totally different topic. I have never in my life, as, as a Packer fan, right, as, a, as an owner, been more afraid of the Chicago Bears this coming season. Okay. Like to, to me, for them to stick around and be all about Justin Fields and 
give him the resources that I think he's going to need. You being a Bears fan, and I, I've told this to, I have a couple guys that are Bears fans in my room. I've never been more afraid of the Bears than, than I am this, this coming fall. So I, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I'm ready for this Aaron Aaron Rodgers fiasco to, to play out and move on and um, to kind of see uh, what the, the new coming of the NSC North is going to be about. Well, that's where I've made a lot of enemies. I make a lot of enemies from three things. Yep. I, I stir the pot in football or say something stupid or I just tweet something stupid and they're like, ah, oh, whatever. The second thing is I think Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan are better than LeBron James. That's my second thing. Are you? Yep. The third thing is I am not a Justin Fields person. Really? Yes. Food. Well, here's – now, this stems from different spots. One – because I'm a fan of Illinois, okay. yep. I hate Ohio State. Okay. Two, I blamed certain fans. Be and now stay with me on this. This my I'm crazy. You're going to think I'm never talking to Steve ever again. When I was younger and LeBron was coming in, I yep. wanted to give him a chance. I was I'm a Kobe Bryant guy. I have a Kobe Bryant band on. Like Kobe Bryant was my dude. Michael Jordan was the dude. Um, it was fans that kind of turned me off. You know how people hate the Cowboys because of fan the the fans. It was kind of the same thing where f- fans were turning me off from LeBron, and then LeBron just kind of did it to himself as the years have gone on. Right. Justin Fields was kind of the same thing. My mindset going into the draft for the Bears was we need offensive linemen. Like that was my i my thought process was if we get offensive linemen offensive players worry about the quarterback later just get somebody in the quarterback position that can do certain things we'll be okay you know like if we worry about this stuff so when justin fields was drafted i was like i hate ohio state this is not what we need blah 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 i've watched him on film where he's done bad things blah 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 but then the season started and i just accepted it i said i'm a bears fan let's accept it it became the fans and the reason why I say the fans because they automatically put him at like Mount Rushmore, like the best of the best. And I said, I think that's where I have a problem. I pump the brakes now. So when I say I'm not a Justin Fields person, I'm not ready to say this. I believe in like a three year mark. So if he continues to take steps forward, like yeah, cool. I think that's yes. where I go. Did you watch QB one? I did. Yes. Okay, so that may have something to do with it, right? A little bit. Were you a fan of Justin Fields when he was at Georgia? No. No. So it's it's been – QB1 probably did it for you. you that you probably, probably – You know, watching him and growing up with his dad. and you know, His dad was very stern on him, right? But he mm-hmm. always had it. You know, he had the, the little show at his high school. He fucking – he tore the jersey off. But the – all the – you might just – it may be a root of – Netflix may be the, the, the root <laughs> of all this, is what I'm getting at. You may not even know it. Maybe subconsciously. Our head football coach is a psychology teacher, so maybe I need to text him and be like, hey, is this possible for me to watch this and then hate him later on in life? Well, let's, uh, let me phrase this. I don't hate him. I don't hate him. I don't think he's terrible. He's super athletic. Oh, I get it. The fact that you're a Cubs fan, though, is is where I'm going to draw the line. Because I'm a Brewers fan. Oh, if I ever have to listen to their stupid song that they wave that stupid little like W flag in the background and uh, go, go, go Cubs, go. I don't even know the rest of the song because I hate it. Like you don't even have somebody as a mascot that that slides down slides in upper left field like the <laughs> Brewers. Do. And the fact that one, I'm going to take a step back. The Brewers renaming Miller Park to American Family Park is is a blasphemy. Like, it's oh. Miller Park. Yes. So, let's get off that high horse. But the fact that I have to even listen, like Sammy Sosa, watching Sammy Sosa against Mark McGuire growing up, right? Hated the Cubs. Hated the Cardinals. I had to go through that as a Brewers fan, as terrible as that was. The best years of Brewers being Ryan Braun, um, you yeah. know, seeing – Sex and uh, Jeremy Vernitz, all those guys be successful and not, you know, we can't even make a World Series. And I see you guys just, you know, win it. Tears me apart. 
And my one of my best friends is a Cubs fan from Madison, Wisconsin. I don't know how that works. <laughs> if I see the Cubs fan in the background, the the flag in the background. It it, it tears me up. And the fact that you guys still have a uh, terrible stadium gives me a little smile inside. Um, so you know, you guys can have the IV and the and the the outfields and all that stuff. But um, you know, hopefully we can catch a baseball game here someday. Well, this was a fun podcast after that, after that comment. No, no, uh, no we do need a lot was just said there that I have to unravel because I have a big white W hanging over there. I just can't get it to bring over here. Well, in Illinois, you're one of three things. You're a Cubs fan, White Sox fan, Cardinal fan. I don't know why. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. I do like Miller Park, though. I went, I've only been there for a Kenny Chesney concert, and it was a great time. Disrespectful. I'm just saying. You haven't, you haven't even seen the Brewers in Miller Park. No, I, 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 I've seen one baseball game in Chicago, and it was at Comiskey. So. I've, I haven't seen – I've been to Wrigley Field only like four times. The best t- – if this says anything, I'm a Cubs fan, but this should tell you something – the most fun is the rooftop. I've heard that. I've been to four rooftops, I think. I've heard you also shouldn't carry your wallet down there. Carry what? Your wallet. I heard it's not like the best part of town. I do because I'm 6'5", 280 pounds. Nobody's going to... I'll be just fine. <laughs> I've got bad information then. I've got, I've got to go attack my friends. Well, again, I'm not from... Chicago. I'm from central Illinois where now maybe not anymore, but you used to keep your car door unlocked and all that stuff. Like it was just yep. um I live in I don't even live in Cook County. Like I live way I live an hour away from the city. I don't even live in Cook County. That's great. Um the highlight there. You should clip but, that. I, sh- I- in Cook County. That's 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 the highlight right there, man. Well, because when you grow up in central Illinois and go to EIU, EIU gets a lot of people from Chicago and the suburbs to go to college there. <clears throat> they don't even tell you where they're from. They're not, not going to say Naperville. They're not going to say like Aurora or these towns. They just say Chicago. Yeah. Even like Naper- Naperville is the most like non-Chicago town ever. That's where I live. There you go. One of my professors here at Mankato used to be a police officer sergeant in Naperville. Okay. Like I was heard stories about Naperville and I was like, man, I'm from Sunbury, Wisconsin. Like it can't be that bad. And like I remember like driving through there and like the way he painted it was like, man, it's Chicago. And I drove through one day, I'm like, this is Na- Naperville. And so like any any Chicago kid that's on the, the roster at Mankato, you can ask him, like, oh, you're from Naperville, huh? <laughs> hate it. They hate it. Yeah, pushing buttons though every once in a while. No, uh, because I don't know if you, if you know I don't know if you know where Elmhurst is. Yeah. That that's where I coach baseball at is York High School. Okay. And then north of there, just a little bit, is Addison Trail High School. That's where I work at, coach basketball and uh, football. Then I coach baseball at York. Um, York is more Chicago than Naperville because it's so much closer. Oh man, I remember this is a funny story. So, like my one and only year being the head coach in 2017, we went down to uh, Justin. Wasn't it Lake Forest? Lake Forest, Lake Forest Academy. Uh huh. We're a Madison Abundant Life uh, Christian school, and like we're in a school bus. We're going down there to play, and like I, me, I'm the head coach. I, you know, it was like take a little nap, right? And so yeah. I take a little. My buddy starts shaking me like 45 minutes, 50 minutes into it. I'm like, what is going on here? He's like, hey, I, I don't think the bus driver knows where we're going. So I wake up and I'm like, I'm dusting my eyes off. I'm looking around. I'm like, we're in downtown Janesville. Like not on the highway. Like in down. I'm like, what in what is going on here? We were two hours late for the start of the game. And so <laughs> I, I thoughts of of that area are, you know, just give me flashbacks to, you know, having to delay a football game because my bus driver didn't understand where we're supposed to go. I don't, I don't understand where in Illinois he thought we were going to go. 
Um, but that was one of the like, hey, um, I don't. He had some map quests like papers out. This is like 2017. I'm like, bro, pull out your phone and just plug it in. Like, figure it out, bud. And <laughs> like, I have my phone and, and give him step by step directions. And oh, we got smoke. We took the oh, so we took the opening kickoff to the house. I'm like, yeah, this is gonna be great. We lost like 50 some to seven. It was <laughs> it was you know, from there. But um, that's a great story about uh, my bus driver that that was that took us to like I thought we were going to some like pub or some uh little get together with some sauerkraut in Janesville or something like that but <laughs> and maybe we're getting there but I guess that was that was after the days of uh closing down I don't remember like Forrest I think that's where Schiffman coached yeah the, the college aspect yep yep he was down there for for a few years yeah that's way north I don't care if it's way north of Chicago I just I don't go to the city I don't I don't go to the city. I don't it's, it's all it's all basically it's Chicago. I don't live it's, in Chicago. Yeah, it's it's the same area. It's up in that northeast corridor. They got tolls and stuff around there, whatever. You make it through there, you Gary, Indiana, you're all good. I have to pay I have to go through tolls just to get to work, so it's everywhere. It's blasphemy. You, you need to talk to your employer. Start getting reimbursements or something. Oh, you think a school is going to pay for that? Road? Well, do they holes or like every pothole that I ran over, I would take a picture of. Like I'm paying for you to fill this. Illinois is such a great state. It's so the governor does a great job. <laughs> You're trying to be a higher up here someday, huh? No, the governor I, can kiss my you know, because I can't even make it down my side street without running over nine di different potholes. One of my tires keeps losing air. I have to fill it up every week, and I'm so sick and tired of, of filling up, but I don't I don't feel like getting a new tire. I'm just that kind of guy. It'll so, it'll right. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um another thing <laughs> with Ellen. No, no, I'm not I'm, I'm getting so where my fiance's parents live to get to their house, there's construction. That construction's been going on since 2018, I think. I don't think it's ever been... no news. some brand new exit, then they gotta do these lanes, and then then COVID, and then like it's just been like it's 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 Makes uh, sense. you know, I don't know. That governor can kiss my you know what. That's what I he's, he's a great person and you're the next elected, so I, I always said, remember growing up in Madison. I think it was, I don't know if it was a Trump election or what it was, but somebody was running for governor. They built a bunch of uh, billboards on the Beltline. It was like a bunch of stuff about how they're going to do Wisconsin. One of the billboards was like, hey, let's build a wall to keep the fibs out. So, like, I always loved that billboard just because, you know, there's a lot of Illinois guys that come up to the Beltline and make, you know, drive fast. So I, was, I, I thought it was very clever. You know, I just I gave him a little credit. And I'm I didn't vote for him, but you know, I thought about it. Something I, I contemplated. You know, I'm not saying you're a fit. I'm not. I'm, I'm definitely would not say that coming from my lips. But I, you know, there's there are some fibs down there. Well, see, I'm from Central Illinois. So I feel like those us yeah, have more. We have more in common with you guys than what you think when we're from there. Hundred percent. Like I'm. In so in Illinois, people that listen, there's a road called I-80. And we always say south of I-80, nobody up here know in the suburbs and in Chicago, they don't know anything south of I-80 whatsoever. Look at all the fits. Right. And if you if you talk to people and they go, there's cornfields and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, this is where your food comes from. Did you not know that's what happens? Oh, we've gone off the we've gone off the tracks. This is exactly how I would thought your podcast would go with me. So, well, sports Joe Rogan. I'm telling you right now, that's you're on your way. I want I'm, oh. I want people to be comfy. So if they want to talk about that, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I don't care. It's good. It, it lasts a lot longer, and you let them be there. Them uh, wherever they want to be. You know, I like it. Like I said, when I started it, if you go back, 
I'm really shocked you said you listened to this because not very many people come on and like know what this is. Really? Oh, I've listened to probably 10, 12 of your podcasts. Yeah, this, I think you're going to be number 456. Oh, wow. Yeah, I haven't listened to that many. But yeah, I've listened to quite a few. There's been some good ones that I've listened to. There's been good ones and some bad ones. The longest one. The longest one that you've had, like duration wise. I don't know if it counts. It was four hours. Jeez. But this podcast is like the reason why it's not very big is because I go all over the place because I just don't understand the world of internet things and podcasting things. So like I said, when I started it, it was going to be Pat McAfee style. And then maybe on the side would be football drawing like on YouTube or whatever. And then it turned into, I'm just going to talk to coaches. Yeah. And then I realized, because this, the Coach Steve show is not what it was called. I called it the sidelines because I was like, it's just going to be coaches. But then I realized I pigeonholed myself to like just this. Right. And so then I try to expand it. Well, then my friend who's a football track coach still in central Illinois where we grew up and my other friend, he now lives in Florida. He's a dietitian. He loves sports, though. We played sports together. We decided every Sunday, let's get on and just talk sports. So that's why it turns into like two hours. Well, then one night, one day they said, hey, what if we just hop on and podcast like we're doing right now? Just BS. Let's just this is whatever. I said, sure. So we get to two and a half hours and they both said, Hey, we got to make this Joe Rogan right now. We got to get to the third and fourth wall. So we got to three hours and then it's three and a half. And I'm like, one, my, my fiance is going to shoot me because she like was hanging out with the neighbors. And I'm like, I'm supposed to be doing that, all this stuff. And they go, Nope, we got to get to four hours. So I think it was like four hours and two minutes. <laughs> And another part of podcasting is the title of each episode sucks. I had to figure that out. So it's just called Podcast After Dark is what it's called. Just Podcast After or like After Dark or whatever. I love it. But that is that that I don't know if you consider because it, it was just like we talked sports, we talked whatever, whatever it was. But when it's actually like me asking a person to come on, maybe two hours or so. That's impressive. I'd run out of things to talk about. But... Uh, I remember one thing I was going to ask you, but that was so far long ago that I don't even know if it makes sense now to ask anymore. Um, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Go for it. So, going way back to your GA comment about like how tough it is to be a GA because they don't get paid well and everything else. I am friends with um, Nick Davis. He's the head coach at Ottawa now. He went to Charleston High School where I coached at. He's way old. He's older than me, but like he's from that town. Um, I had asked him this before because he was the DC at Rose Holman at the time, and I said, "There's less coaches in high school. Are you seeing less coaches in college now? And is the reason why because they're seeing the GA thing? Like I don't want to make." seven thousand dollars a year and like do this and do that and he actually said yeah he goes i think that is because he did the same thing you did he dove in he lived off of food stamps he did everything he could to like get where he is because he loved it he's like i'm sacrificing to do this so when you said that i was like i just don't thinking back on it i don't know if i would do that right now i mean i'm 32 now but like Maybe when I was 21, maybe. But I think yeah. that's pushing them think, away. Like, like I was 20, I think I was 28, either 28 or 29 when I came back as a GA, which is, you know, we call them restricted earnings here because it's not technically a GA. Um, uh -huh. I have to take classes when I came back. Um, but like I would have never made it if I didn't sell everything I had. Like I sold my house. I remember like I made like thirty four, thirty five thousand dollars off my house and you know, sold a lot of things around that, you know, I it's funny because like I, I had left a six figure job to come 
work for seven thousand dollars a year mm-hmm. uh, and so that was a big adjustment to you know sacrifice what i had kind of learned and what i thought life would be to chase a dream um i i think it's really hard for kids these days to you know especially mostly gas most gas are are guys that have played you know the sport and you know you go from being a student that's not you know making much money to you know a job that you're not making much money in and i think a lot of people just want to you know chase their degree which there's no problem there's no issue with that mm-hmm. but i think it, it's you know everybody wants the instant gratification of getting a full-time coaching job and it's it, you need to put in the work and i think a lot of kids and a lot of young adults think that they've already put that work in that's that's needed to be that person and it it just doesn't correlate over to successful gas and um, you know, I think a lot of people that, that do want to become GAs and do become, you know, want to become coaches are, I'm seeing more and more GAs and, and guys that are young in this profession that didn't play college. Mm-hmm. And some of those guys, you know, are trying to fulfill, you know, their dream and what they want to do and maybe what they didn't get to do as a player, but also they've always wanted to be a coach. And how do you become a coach and do that full time these days? And you can't do that at the high school level. You definitely can't do it at the middle school level. Um, you can't just jump into professional sports, but how do you become a, a, a coach and do it full time? And um, I, I think it's something that takes patience. It takes, um, you know, hard work and, and understanding that it's it's a process that, that happens over time. It happens over months and, and years. And um, it, it's the, the, <laughs> this day and age there's so many kids and people and young adults that want that instant gratification of it's like, I I should be owed this or I'm guaranteed this, or this is going to happen in six months where like a lot of coaches and, and rightfully so you should have to prove it just like any other job out there. And Mm -hmm. as long as you're willing to put in the work and, and really just grind for, forever along it, whether it be a year, two years, three years of um, trying to do what's best for the program and not, and put your kind of your individual goals and successes aside, you're going to be successful. And I think also from a standpoint of there's a lot of people from a GA standpoint that want that perfect job as their first full-time job. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, being comfortable in a position gets you, lackadaisical it gets you into a point where you're not able to grow and you know that's always something that i thought of you know i was here for two years as a as a restricted earnings ga and um you know the upper iowa job you know if you were to ask me when i got a college coaching if i were to take a full-time job at upper iowa and fayette um iowa and northeast iowa where i had to live 40 minutes away and drive 40 minutes each way to go um you know coach guys at a, a university that had won two games in three years, I probably would have laughed at you. And so I think from a standpoint of you need to take chances, you need to um, go after things that maybe you didn't think that were your path. Cause as a coaching at the college level, nobody knows their path. Nobody knows the extent of the work you have to put in, but also what your next step is and just understand that there are going to be, be people that take chances on you you don't know who those people are but when people take chances on you and people vouch for you and people um stand at the table for you you need to make them right and Mm -hmm. work as hard as you possibly can for those people and when you get to a point where i'm at now um you know being able to i don't want to say relax but also like get comfortable with where i'm at and really try to hone in with the guys i'm working with um because i'm not i'm not trying to I'm not a coach that's trying to be the next best division one coach would that be awesome yes mm-hmm. but I'm not every resume and, and every job application like, like I tell my head coach like I said before the only job I'm looking for right now is if the Wisconsin Badgers called and, and want to give me an online coach but they, they ain't calling I, I can guarantee that so I'm gonna be where my feet are I'm gonna be um you know 
really work as hard as I possibly can for this university here. And it just so happens to be my alma mater. So it makes it a lot easier, but I think if guys understand, you know, where you come from, where you're going to be, it's not going to be this path that you think it's going to be. It's just going to happen over time from your hard work and the relationships you make. And it is a lot about relationships. It's about like going to camps and meeting people. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really good coaches over the years, just going to camps and, you know, hanging out with them and, and asking the questions and go to clinics and, um, you know, make relationships with guys. It's a lot like recruiting. Um, relationship with other coaches are a lot like, like just being a good person and having good conversation with people so that someday you can reconnect with those person, that person, or, um, you know, just really buying into, you know, being yourself and not trying to be somebody that's not you. And mm -hmm. I, I think if people understand that from a GA standpoint, you'll be successful, but it kind of goes back to the original statement of people want instant gratification. They want that, Hey, I just graduated college. I got this nice shiny degree that's in this cool little holder that says the university on the front. I'm going to go make a bunch of money. And um, they end up being really unhappy with what they do because they're just chasing something that is money oriented. And that's something I was, I was able to kind of live through and whether that be good experiences, bad experiences, um, you know, you end up, I always, I said this to my old line in my old line meeting today of, you know, I always try to have more of just old line talk and, you know, kind of teach them things, but um, making more money just means you're going to spend more money. If you just a, a regular human being, and I think you need to be really good with money to be able to make more money and, and save it. It's especially these days, you know, I was a hunter. I used to hunt a bunch. I, I, I'm really glad that I don't get to because I were usually playing and mm -hmm. the opener Thanksgiving week, but, like I remember like buying all the fish houses and like crossbows and like all the stuff that I'd never even, it's just, it's all stuff that you end up just spending money on just to spend money on to be happy when you're trying to chase the thing that you're truly want to do the rest of your life and the job. And um, if you can find something you can do every day and get paid for it and have um, happiness, that's worth all the money in the world in my eyes. Yeah. I, I remember I coached in my high school for a little bit. Then I went to the Charleston high school and I remember going, I want the keys because I know it all, you know, I wanted it. I was that person. So I never coached anything below varsity football, believe it or not. Like never, I was 19 years old. Hey, you're helping out varsity. Like it was just, my head coach was like, you're going to help out varsity, blah, 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 blah. He ran the old power. I triple option. Like, you know what you played in it. You're going to help whatever. So when I went to Charleston. I said, I, wanted to do this. I want to do this. And the head coach who was his first year going, Oh, this is what you want to do. You're going to go do this. You're still going to be varsity, but you're going to do running backs and linebackers. And I said, I don't know what that is. And, uh, so I understand yeah. instant, instant gratification yeah. stuff. I know the, so I, I, some people I tell like, it's okay to not do that. Cause then I got the OC thing and I'm like, I know everything. And then, <laughs> So I, so I tell people it's okay to not know, but the problem was that head coach left a different, the DC became the head coach. We, I put up with the stuff I didn't like because I was the OC. I was blinded. I was like, well, I'm the OC. It's okay. This stuff's okay. Um, and we butted heads and then I realized, oh, I have to be the bad cop around here because he's the good cop. Like, Kids are getting doing what they want, blah, 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 blah. They're talking back to us. Like a kid told a coach to be quiet and he just kind of let it slide, like that type of thing. And so I realized, okay, I got to be old school. I got to be the mean guy. And it got to the point where kids were like, here comes Coach Steve because I was the bad cop. So when I came up here, I realized I have to be the bad cop sometimes, but I'm going to be different. Like I don't have to be that person. So I understand being someone you're not supposed to be. Like I'm not supposed to be this guy that yells at this kid and say, Turn that speaker off. That's stupid. Like, what's your problem? Blah, 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 blah. Like, get off my lawn type of thing. Like, I don't need to do that anymore. Um, now that I'm older, too, my heart rate goes up a little bit quicker now. So it's like I can't do that either. Um, basketball did that. I've had John here for a long time. Here's a funny story. So, you know, you get these fancy Apple watches, blah, blah, blah. Basketball, 
I'm very hyped up. I'm very whatever. I look down because my watch is going off. And I'm like, who's calling? No, your heart rate's like 170, 180 beats per minute. And I'm like, <laughs> so should I be having a heart attack? Like, it's it's going I, off. I think that classifies as a heart attack. So I realized that. So my game's over. The next game's going on. I'm sitting at the end of the bench, just kind of whatever. And I look down. It's still like 140 or so, 150. And I'm like, okay, this is a problem. So I went home. I had a coming to Jesus moment with myself. And the rest of the school, or the rest of the basketball season, it never got up more than 100 or so. I can't, I would always look at it and be like, oh, you know, it's wow. fine. So my assistant coach on our end of the year thing, it's his last year. He's been coaching for like 14 years, 15 years. He go, he was talking and he goes, he looked at the next guy that's going to be the assistant next year. And he goes, part of your job is to make sure Steve's heart rate doesn't get up to 180 beats per minute. Crazy. Oh, I was like, and I, I look over I'm like, you got a hell of a job because yeah. I'm an ass. Keep me calm, please. Yeah, I was like, I need a get back guy. So You're now, welcome. so this fall, I'm going to check football. I'm going to see what my heart rate is during football because I'm like, if I'm doing this in basketball, football is going to be. Like, yeah, it'll be. That's the thing I've always had to like worry about with where where our stadiums at. Like we don't have a track around the stadium, and Blakesley is like always known as like my dad always said it's one of the best places to watch a college football game because the stands are just so vertical and it's right on top of you and mm -hmm. everything you say and so that's always been like my mindset of like talking to my guys of like really like don't like i i've lost my cool plenty of times but like lose your cool in a classical way like lose your cool in a in a way that they understand that because everybody can hear it. Everybody mm -hmm. for three sections can hear what I'm saying. Um, that's, that's kind of been the hard thing of being able to get a, a point across without disrespecting kids. And that's always been a little bit different from the coach that I had when I was here of like teaching these kids as a coach rather than MF and kids because they did something wrong. I think, um, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was like kids don't try to do things wrong. They just make mistakes. And it's your job to understand that they make mistakes, but you need to correct those mistakes so that they don't make them again. And if they continue to make them, it's your fault for not teaching them the way that you need to. And now don't get me wrong. There's some kids that just can't be taught, but um, understanding that there's a way to talk to kids. There's a way to teach rather than, um, talking down to kids has really kind of come along as as a, a way of doing things because I had to because everybody could hear what I was saying and that's been a, a godsend for for how I teach my kids these days. Again, I can relate to that. I had coached at in 2018 at a school called Glenbard East, and the next year I went to East Aurora, and. Our game got canceled that Friday because there was a bad storm that came through, so they moved it to Saturday. Well, Saturday was homecoming, so of course there wasn't many people there. They were getting ready, blah, blah, blah. Nobody's there. The old line come off. I was very fortunate that we could kind of two-platoon the line at least for a little bit. Now, some would rotate in, whatever. So at least when they all come off, or at least that split minute, I could talk to them real quick. They're coming off. Well, they're arguing with each other. Like, they're yelling at each other, blah, 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 blah. So it's quiet. I didn't realize it was quiet because you have one of these on, you know, you know, whatever. I'm yelling, shut the F up, sit the F down. I'm just, you know, you're going off. And then I say my spiel. Then I walk away. The head coach grabs me and he goes, Steve, I have no problem with what you said, but you got to realize eh, those people right there, they just heard every word you said because it's so quiet. And I was like, oh, my bad. It's such a horror. That's a hard feeling, man. Because like you, you're passionate about it, right? It's you aren't doing it because you dislike the kid. You just get your emotions take the best of you, and that's that's something that's so hard to control. It's so hard to control. 
because you, you're caught in the moment, right? You yes. obviously care about the kids you're around. You want them to do well. And it's it's being able to communicate that in effectively without doing it disrespectfully, especially these days. Kids kids handle that sort of teaching. It, they shut down. And so understanding, one, what your kids can take, but two, from a standpoint of what, you know, maybe the bystanders can take, you know, them hearing you is is something you've definitely had to learn to control over the years, especially lately. Well, because that school is, for East Aurora is like, I don't know if it's the hood, I guess it's the hood, I guess, I don't know, it was kids that... It was kids that lived in hotels. It was kids that, you know, didn't have their parents. It was. And so some people are like, do you said that to them? And I said, do you realize that I can say that to them? I realized that like my left tackle, God bless him. If somebody said the wrong thing to him, he was ready to throw down. But the stuff they said to him to get him to throw down, I could say it to him. And he'd be like, okay, like, do you realize what I had to do? the work I had to do, the Jedi mind tricks I had to do in order to get these kids to be like, he, like, it really was that. It was, if another coach yelled at the old line, they would say, you can't say that to us. Only Coach Steve can. So then I would have to come over and say it. Like, like the, the mind tricks I had to pull. But from that point on to where the school I'm at now, I realize that there's times where I can freak out. But I've also realized like halftime, halftime is where I usually would freak out, like just whatever. Now I've realized, like, I'm going to talk to you like adults. Like, I'm to a point now where I know when to yell. I know when to do it. And then I've also gotten to the point where it took me a long time to figure this out. Do all the yelling and practice. Then when the game time comes around, you just kind of have to. Yeah. yeah. You, you have to be calm to fix whatever's going on. And there's one way to motivate them. It's another way to to do whatever. And I've gotten told that for years. Coach Bennett, who's on Twitter, he's a high school coach. He told me that years ago. He was like, I don't yell in games. Like, I don't freak out because it's too late. And well, I'm like, you're crazy. I got to yell. I got to do this. I got to do this. And I think last year was the first year for football where halftime, I'm just kind of like, hey, like, if you're going to let them be men to you and you're not going to act like, like just that I'm not yelling, but I'm just trying to talk to them like, hey, you know. We're, we're, we're sucking right now and blah, 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 or, you know, and I'm not yelling, but they're just kind of like, they actually listen more. Yeah. I think once you hone that in and understand how you talk to those kids, it's, it's so beneficial, but it's, it's a long road to try to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Takes a long time. And then is I've bounced around schools. I've coached football at five different high schools. Last year, I worked at Addison, coached football at Addison. I coached basketball at Nequa Valley High School in Naperville. And I coached baseball at York. So I was at three different high schools. You want to talk about challenging on my mental health. Crazy. The driving part, which I live in Naperville, so it wasn't like a big deal. But then the, the the battle of reaching Addison Trail kids, then you're trying to reach Nequa kids, and then you're trying to reach York kids. Yeah. And believe it or not, though, now that I'm getting all at one high school, it's I've taken everything from that and kind of molded it to like how I can talk to kids now. So it's actually helped me a little bit. Um. Well, coach, I didn't realize it's been an hour and almost 50 minutes. Really? That's how much fun we've had. I, I could go for a couple more hours, but I'm sure my wife would probably yell at me when I get done with it. Not that I'm, I don't mind a little ribbing every once in a while from her, but um, usually I have to take the dogs out eventually and do some dishes. So I, okay. I can't for, um, you know, having me on it. It's been way too long to get this. And, you know, I, I look forward to uh, another day doing it with you and, you know, I just think I think very highly of you and, and what you do. And, you know, I, obviously, I, I hope you know that uh, as a resource, as somebody that, you know, I would always reach out to, but also from the same standpoint of view of, you know, my, my phone's always on. And, um, you know, I, I just really think that you're doing a great job of, you know, doing the podcast thing, but also, you know, connecting coaches all over the Midwest with other coaches is, is something I'm I'm excited to continue to listen to and, 
I'm just I'm just really appreciative of you having me on, man. Well, no, I appreciate you. You're I told you you were big time. I, I tweeted yesterday as soon as you said yes and we had it down. Did you see that tweet? No, I appreciate it. Beauty part of that Zoom was I could pause the whole thing. You see that? It's good. It's like a, I ended up in a different spot. It's like magic. It's two uh, episodes right here. <laughs> All in one. <laughs> well, no, I appreciate it. Um, I don't know if I could ever help you out, but if you ever need something, you let me know. Um, but I appreciate it. Um Guys listening or watching, I'll put his Twitter in the bio um, and all that stuff if you are you don't follow him. Um, I will keep track of Minnesota State football this fall the best I can. Um, and I'll definitely have you on again. I'll be reaching out again. Don't worry. It'll happen. Yes. I would um, love that. Well, guys, thanks for watching or listening, and we will see you next time.